Welcome to the body imaging cases. This is a case of a 43-year-old man presented with shortness of breath. CT of the chest shows four patterns of lung involvement, more or less mixed together. Reticular pattern, ground glassing, honeycombing, and bronchiectasis. The reticular pattern is simply the presence of abnormal lines forming a network at the lung periphery and entangling the two other patterns, the ground glassing and the honeycombing. Ground glassing is the higher attenuation value than normal, which nevertheless does not reach the level of consolidation. And the honeycombing is the formation of small air cysts at the periphery of the lung. Bronchiectasis is the fourth pattern we can identify here. It can be recognized in different forms. Either the bronchi or the bronchioles have diameter larger than the corresponding arteries, or their wall is thickened, or they fail to taper, or they can be identified at the lung periphery, where in the normal they should not be identified. What is seen here is the last four. The dilated bronchioles are identified at the periphery of the lung. These findings help us recognize the rather subtle form of cylindrical bronchiectasis for which we have to actively search, unlike the cystic bronchiectasis, which is easier to see. This is another site of cylindrical bronchiectasis, evident by wall thickening and the failure of tapering of the box. These four patterns, the reticular pattern, the ground glassing, the honeycombing, and the bronchiectasis are present in almost all types of diffuse interstitial pulmonary disease. Would it be possible then to differentiate between these disease entities? And is it worth the trouble? The answer to the first question is yes. Sometimes we can differentiate between the different disease entities. And the answer to the second is yes, it is worth the trouble because the treatment is different the associated features are different and the prognosis is different. Certain features are observed in this disease more frequently than other entities of the uh, interstitial lung disease spectrum. The first is the sectorial nature or distribution of the involvement with relative sparing of the lung between the sectors. The bronchiectasis in this particular disease goes all the way down to the lung periphery and even merges with the honeycomb. The third feature is the dilatation of the esophagus with formation of uh, a gas fluid level. The minimum intensity projection is a nice technique that can be used to appreciate the bronchiectasis and the honeycombing. Here we can clearly see the sectorial distribution of the disease and the relative sparing of the lung in between the involved sectors. We can also see the bronchiectasis going all the way down to merge with the honeycombing at the periphery of the lungs.
The fourth and most specific feature of this disease is the presence of parallel bands of pluripulmonary involvement at the anterolateral surface of the upper lobes, separated by uninvolved lung surface. In fact, we are dealing here with a case of systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. The parallel band sign is a recently recognized sign for the diagnosis of scleroderma, and with rotation of the lungs on this volume rendered images of the lung surface, we can see the sign to a better advantage. I'm adding here the bony thoracic cage on the lung surface to show that the bands neither coincide with the ribs nor with the intercostal spaces. Why is the pattern of involvement sectorial at the lower lobes and linear at the upper. The answer comes from an old paper published in 1961 about the intrasegmental bronchial tree in the human embryo. And um, they chose that the number of segmental branching ranges between 17 and 25 and, and it is equal in all directions of the segment. If for the anatomical reasons, the one of the dimensions of the segment is smaller than the rest, like for example, here at B, the bronchi will not stop branching. They will bend and go parallel to the surface. This is, in fact, what happens at the uh, upper lobes. The anteroposterior dimension of the upper lobes is significantly smaller compared to the rest of the dimensions. Therefore, the bronchovascular bundles going there will bend and run parallel to the surface. If now the uh, peribronchovascular interstitium of these bronchi will be involved in scleroderma, they will form the bands which we have seen on the surface of the lung. Is it possible to appreciate the scleroderma band sign on the CT sections or it is only a sign to be seen on volume rendered images? The answer is yes, it is possible to recognize the sign on the CT sections, but it is far more obvious and more impressive on the 3D images. The red arrows show here the bands of infiltration and the green arrow, the relatively spared band between the two. On looking at the next the section you can see the continuity of the bands of infiltration and also the continuity of the spared band between the two. Here are our learning points. Scleroderma may present by shortness of breath before other symptoms appear, such as skin manifestations, joint manifestations, gastrointestinal or cardiac manifestations. If uh, the lung is the only organ uh, involved, then there is a danger of um, making the wrong diagnosis or the wrong label that this is an interstitial uh, lung, idiopathic interstitial lung fibrosis. And in fact, many cases of scleroderma have been included uh, under this heading in the past. But nowadays, the diagnosis can be made more specifically and more confidently based on the signs we have just mentioned. That's one. The second thing is the presence of uh, antibodies for the systemic sclerosis, uh, which are uh, now 
one of the good methods to make the diagnosis of scleroderma, even if the lung is the only organ involved. We have learned also about the parallel band sign as a useful sign for the diagnosis of scleroderma. And we have seen the mechanism by which it is produced. We have seen also that the extrapulmonary manifestations of the, the disease, such as esophageal dilatation, can support the diagnosis on CT of the chest. I'm leaving you now the next case, which is a case of a male 55 years with hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatic arteriography has been done before the chemo embolization. And the question we are going to discuss next time is, are we dealing with one lesion or two lesions of the liver?